the next speaker is Joe Anderson. His sons are Rob and John back there, and they provided all the audiovisual stuff. So let's give them a hand. <laughs> Joe, it's all yours. Thank you, brother, <clears throat> brother Welch. I hope what you sped, said about the final speaker isn't true that I'm supposed to be boring. Well, let's see. <clears throat> In discussing Book of Mormon geography, thank you. In discussing Book of Mormon geography, <clears throat> I will rely primarily upon what the Book of Mormon literally states. I believe what the prophet Joseph Smith said that, quote, it says what it means and it means what it says. Most of the references will be, I will not refer to them here, but they'll be in the handouts which will be on the back uh, table. When we apply precisely what the Book of Mormon states by geographically identifying the land and city of Nephi, then we can identify which river was the River Sidon. In other words, if Kaminahuyu was not the city of Nephi and the Salama Valley was Nephi, in other words, if Kaminahuyu was not the city of Nephi and the Salama Valley was, then the Sumacinta is the river Grijalba. Let's begin by building a, what'd I say? Wow. <laughs> Thank you, that makes me feel better. Like I said, it won't be boring. In building a, a basic map, it might be a little bit repetitious, but in building a basic internal map uh, to the uh, Book of Mormon, now I got it. I want to read, Alma tells us, in Le that Lehi landed on the west side of the land of Nephi on the west in the land of Nephi, in the place of their father's first inheritance, and thus bordering along by the seashore. Clearly, that, oh, this is not the one. That's where the landing place has to be. And it, I'll show you, it has to be south of the narrow strip of wilderness, and it has to be on the very west end of the land of Nephi. Then he explains where the land of Nephi was located. Quote, bordering even to the sea on the east and on the west, and which was divided from the land of Zarahemla by a narrow strip of mountainous wilderness, and emphasized mountains, there's lots of information to prove that, which wilderness ran from the sea east even to the sea west, and thus were the Lamanites and the Nephites divided. Okay, there we go. Moroni cut off all the lands and strongholds of the Lamanites in the east sea wilderness, yea, and also on the west sea wilderness, fortifying the line between the Nephites and the Lamanites, between the land of Zarahemla and the land of Nephi from the West Sea, running by the head of River Sidon. And, quote, and the land of Nephi did run in a straight course from the East Sea to the West Sea. Moroni established and maintained this narrow strip of mountains wilderness as a military defensive line beginning about 72 B.C., the Book of Mormon then identifies where the cities of Zarahemla, Manti, and Nephi were, were located relative to this east and west sea and relative to each other and relative to the narrow strip of wilderness and the river Sidon. And it's only by understanding this relationship that can, we can really identify where the river Sidon was located. <clears throat> Zarahemla was the, quote, capital city and and near the, quote, capital parts of the land. It was it 
It was also located north from and yet by or near the narrow strip of wilderness. This indicates that it was in the middle of the land of Zarahemla and not very far from the narrow strip of wilderness. Mormon tells us that Zarahemla was located in the, quote, center of the land. He repeats the term center of the land four times. It says in Helaman, the Lamanites had, quote, come into the center of the land and had taken the capital city, which was the city of Zarahemla. Since the land of Zarahemla extended from the East Sea to the West Sea, then the, land of Zer- then the city of Zarahemla must have been located in the center of the land or about midway between the East Sea and West Sea. Get the wrong one here. Alma says that the Zarahemla was located on the west side of the river Sidon, which river, as we know, flowed northward from the narrow strip of wilderness. Since the river Sidon was located east of Zarahemla, and Zarahemla was located in the center of the land, then the river Sidon also was located, quote, in the center of the land. It, the river Sidon was certainly not located west of the center of the land according to the Book of Mormon. Now, it's important we understand the relationship of Midian and Gideon and Zarahemla and the River Sidon. Uh, I've got the River Sidon up here. It goes from the north up here in the narrow strip of wilderness. It goes by Manti, which I'll show in a minute, and then it goes on the, on the east side of Zarahemla. <clears throat> About following the Sidon southward and upward in elevation from Zarahemla, not more than a couple of miles, was a crossing of the river Sidon where the Amlicites penned Alma in the river near the west bank. Menon and Gideon were each located less than a half a day's march south from that crossing. Menon was located on the west of the Sidon and Gideon was located on the east of the river Sidon. The distance between Menon and Gideon could not have been more than a half a night's march by a tired Amlicite army, about six, seven, eight miles or so, perhaps. Menon was located up and south from Zarahemla in the path to Nephi. Up and south from Zarahemla in the path to Nephi. Quote, in the land of Menon, above the city of Zarahemla, in the course to the land or city of Nephi. Now, Manti was located southwesterly from Gideon because it says Alma was, quote, Alma was journeying from the land of Gideon southward away to the land of Manti. He met the sons of Messiah journeying towards the land of Zarahemla from the Manti area. And so there we have it. It was southward this way, which means the relationship between Zarahemla, Menon, and Manti must have been north-south. This also indicates that Zarahemla was not a great distance from Manti. And that's important to remember. The fact that the Lamanites contemplated attacking Zarahemla from Manti confirms that Zarahemla was located within striking distance from Manti. Quote, neither durst they march down against the city of Zarahemla. Okay, now since Manti was located in the narrow strip of wilderness and by or near Zarahemla, and since Zarahemla, Men and Gideon, and the river Sidon were all located in the center of the land, then Manti also had to have been located midway between the East and West Seas. <clears throat> now the headwaters, the headwaters of Sidon were located higher in elevation from Manti and in the south part of the narrow strip of wilderness, but also near Manti, and there's lots of scriptures to corroborate that. Therefore, Manti and the headwaters of Sidon must have been located, if not closer to the East Sea, then at least midway between the East and West Seas. This conclusion is confirmed because Alma stated, quote, neither durst they cross the head of Sidon over to the city of Nephiha. And Nephiha was located, Nephiha is located toward near Manti, and Manti was located on the sea, making this relationship probably closer to the East Sea than to the West Sea. <clears throat> Both Nephiha and Zarahemla 
were, were located, like I said, close to Manti because they were both potential military targets for the Lamanites from Manti. Now for the more interesting question and critical was where was the city of Nephi located? The Book of Mormon indicates the city of Nephi was located so close to the narrow strip of wilderness that the people could see it from Nephi and Shilom. Very important. The hill north of Shilom was in the foothills of the wilderness. The hill north of Shilom is discussed three times in the Book of Mormon. It was located two or three miles from Shilom. Nephi was located within a mile or two southerly from Shilom. Shemlon was located not more than a couple of miles eastward from Nephi and Shilom. You may ask, how can you possibly get that information out of the Book of Mormon? And that's a very good question. That's what I will address now. The following scriptures that refer to the three accounts about the hill north of Shilom will help us understand how close the cities of Nephi, Shilom, and Shemlon were to each other, and thus to the hill north of Shilom, and thus to the narrow strip of wilderness. Number one, King Mosiah gathered his followers on the hill north of Shilom, to the hill north of Shilom when he fled Nephi. After the Nephites had, uh oh, after the Nephites had lived in the land of Nephi for about 370 years, King Mosiah won, obeyed the Lord, and fled from Nephi to Zarahemla. Omni and Mosiah state the following, quote, Mosiah did according as the Lord had commanded him, and they departed out of the land of Nephi into the wilderness, up to the hill north of Shilom, which had been a place of resort for the children of Nephi at the time they fled out of the land, then through the wilderness until they came down into the land which is called the lander city of Zarahemla. This hill north of Shilom was a gathering place, was a gathering place for, to gather all the people around Nephi and Shemlon and all those that would follow the voice of the Lord. How many were there? Five, 20,000? It's unclear. The important point is that the hill north of Shilom was located at the very southern edge of the narrow strip of wilderness according to these scriptures. And it must have been an area large enough and with sufficient water where several thousand people fleeing from Nephi, Shilom, and the surrounding area could have gathered and lived, quote, a place of resort for at least a few days before traveling from there through the wilderness and then down to Zarahemla. It was not a small hill, and it was a defensible place of resort for the fleeing Nephites. The second scripture, King Noah built a temple tower, and a great tower on the hill north of Shilom. Mosiah 9, quoting Zenoph, states that the king of the Lamanites, quote, covenanted with me that I might possess the land of Nephi-Lehi and the land of Shilom. He also commanded that his people should depart out of the land cities, and I and my people went into the cities, and we began to build buildings and to repair the walls of the city. Yea, even the walls of the city, Lehi, Nephi, and the city of Shilom. <clears throat> Remember that there must have been defensive walls around each of the cities of Nephi and Shilom. <clears throat> and the city of, and also remember the city of Shemlon, which I'll show you would have been right over here, and these, Shemlon, that the Lamanites had not maintained the walls at all at Nephi and Shilom. Now, Mosiah continues saying, Noah, quote, built a tower near the temple. Yea, he could stand upon top of thereof and overlook the land of Shilom and also the land of Shemlon, which was possessed by the Lamanites, and he could even look all over the land round about. And he caused a great tower to be built on the hill north of the land of Shilom. All of these areas must have been within a few miles of each other, including the hill north of Shilom, because they were visible from Nephi. And remember that King Noah could see the Lamanite soldiers coming from Shemlon from his tower near the temple. Without binoculars, one cannot see people further than two miles. King Limhi could see the Lamanite preparations for war at Shemlon from the temple tower. So it's very close. Number three, Ammon and his 15 scouts used the hill north of Shilom as their base to observe Shilom. There you got the two towers I forgot to show you, and then Ammon. 
<clears throat> to observe Shilam and Nephi. About 121 BC, Ammon and 15 others were sent by Mosiah to uh, inquire about Zenith and his followers. Remember, over 60 to 70 years had passed without communication between Zarahemla and, and Nephi. Quote, they knew not the course they should travel in the wilderness to go up to the land of Nephi. And when they had wandered in the days, in, in the narrow strip of wilderness, 40 days, they came to a hill which is north of the land of Shilom, and there they pitched their tents. And Ammon took three of his brethren and went down into Nephi, to the land of Nephi. And King Limhi then commanded his guards that they should go up to the hill which is north of Shilom and bring their brethren into the city, indicating the close relationship that existed there. This city of Nephi was located just southward from Shilom, about a mile or so. The hill north of Shilom was located not more than two or three miles from Shilom because Ammon could see Shilom and Nephi from that hill. This was a prominent hill and the one that was located at the very southern edge of the narrow strip of wilderness. Since all of these locations and cities were, based, were located with, within several miles of each other, then the city of Nephi must have been located about midway between the east and west seas and directly south of the city of Zarahemla, Menon, and Manti. And this is the final configuration that, that is described in the Book of Mormon. And there's a definite east and north-south relationship between these three, and there's a closeness between Manti and Zarahemla, and there's a closeness between Seed and Nephi and the narrow strip of wilderness right here. Okay. Now let's look at the geography of the area. Um, looking at a couple of Google Maps of the area and see how this internal map fits into the geography of Mesoamerica. First, this is a satellite view showing where the collision of the North American Teutonic Plate with the Caribbean Plate formed the Cuchumatanas and Santa Cruz chain of mountains extending from the Pacific to the Gulf of Honduras. And these are the huge Humatanas Mountains. They go up above 10,000 feet. These are the Santa Cruz Mountains, and they go all the way out here to the Gulf of Honduras. And this is the narrow strip of wilderness. This is the Shoshoi Fault Line through here, and where those two plates meet. This is the only geologic formation in all the Americas that forms a chain of mountain that runs from east to west, from sea to sea, that is narrow and rugged, and that could have been a viable defensive line that Moroni could have used to protect the Nephites on the north from the Lamanites on the south. The area just south of where the two mountains meet is the only area where there's a reasonable passageway through this chain of mountains to Coban and then to the interior of Guatemala, and that's right through here, there's a pass. <clears throat> Garth Norman, Dr. Richard Hauk, the Allens, and many, many others believe that this Cuchumatan Santa Cruz chain of mountains to be that narrow strip of mountainous wilderness identified in the Book of Mormon. It is the most identifiable geographic feature mentioned in the Book of Mormon, and much so more so than the narrow neck of land. <clears throat> the following will be the application of the internal map to the geogra Google geographical map. Okay, so here we have the narrow strip of wilderness following the Cuchumatanas and Santa Cruz Mountains, and of course north of that, Zarahemla go from the East Sea to the West Sea, the Pacific is the West Sea, land of Nephi, same place, sea to sea. Now let's add the locations of the cities of Zarahemla, Menon, Gideon, and Manti, the Grijalva and the Sumacinta rivers. Also on this map is a tributary to the Sumacinta called the Iqbole River in dark blue. The dark blue here, this is the Iqbole River. It goes right there at Sumacinta down up to near Manti. The Sumacinta comes around here. One, one branch starts up here where the Grijalva starts. The Grijalva is in green. And one branch starts right here. Another branch starts south here, the Strip of Wilderness. There are several branches of the Umacinta River go in there. And I'd just like to men mention that regardless of which river it was, it has to include all of the tributaries to that particular river. So now we have these, uh, these cities placed there like described in the internal map of the Book of Mormon. Now let's add the city of Nephi midway between the east and west seas 
right there, Solomon Hills, midway between the East and West Seas, just south of the narrow strip of wilderness, as required by the Book of Mormon. And of course, the landing place right over here. <clears throat> now, which is the city of Nephi? Kaminahuyu or Salama? There are currently only two viable propositions for the location of city Nephi in Mesoamerica. One, the Salama, uh, Salama area right here, just south of the narrow strip of wilderness, I mean, yeah, and, and south of Zarahemla, or two, the, uh oh, it's not on there. Did I miss one? There it is. Or two, uh, Kaminahuyu, which is Guatemala City right here, which is about 40 miles south of Salama, and it's about 165 miles south east of Santa Rosa, which is on the Grijalva model, is the city of Zarahemla. I have formulated six crit critical questions based upon Book of Mormon references, which, I will allow, which will allow a comparison between Kaminahuyu and Salama. These are the six questions. Is there a hill north of Shilam at Kaminahuyu, like we've discussed? Number two, are the Kuchumatanas Mountains visible from Kaminahuyu? Number three, is Kaminahuyu located in the center of the land of Nephi? Number four, were there pre-classic defensive walls around Kaminahuyu? Number five, was there a ruin, Shilam, two miles or so north of Kaminahuyu where pre-classic defensive walls existed? And number six, was Kaminahuyu a safe place for Nephi to settle about 585 BC? <clears throat> If the answer I submit to any one of those questions is in the negative, would mean that Kaminahuyu would not have been the city of Nephi. And hence, the Grijalva River was probably not the site. Okay, the answer is as to Kaminahuyu. Is there a hill north of Shilam at Kaminahuyu? No. And this is evidenced by the following two maps. This is a topographical map, relief map, showing the Kaminahuyu Plateau, 5,000 feet in dark brown. In the dark brown is the plateau, 5,000 feet. The light brown is the ravine area below 5,000 feet. The green here and here, west and southeast, are, are mountains, but northward is not even a single hill above the 5,150 feet of the elevation at Kaminahuyu. Next, next is a cross section. Is a cross section of the actual elevations from the Pacific coast, from the Pacific coast up here to Kaminahuyu, elevation 5,150 feet, and then down the Motawa River Basin and up to over the Kuachus Mountains, and then down the Salama Valley, then up over the Narrow Strip Wilderness and down to Usima Sintha River. Notice the plateau, the Kaminahuyu Plateau right there. There is no hill above 5,150 feet in that entire plateau, northward from Kaminahuyu. Okay, number two. Can one see Cuchumatan Sierra Santa Cruz Mountains from Kaminahuyu? No. The 6,000 foot Cuchuacus Mountain prohibits one from seeing the narrow strip of mountainous wilderness from Kaminahuyu. The distance of about 50 or more miles, air miles, from Kaminahuyu also limits the visibility of that range of mountains. Number three, is Kaminahuyu located in midway between the east and west seas? No. Kaminahuyu is located 60 miles from the Pacific and 140 miles from the Gulf of Honduras. Number four, Did Kaminahuyu have pre-classic defensive walls around it? No. This was a dominant culture and had no need for defensive walls. This community of Kaminahuyu, contrary to what's been said here, really had its beginning about 1500 BC. It began as a small community and it began enlarging its borders and uh, in the process of expanding its borders, I'm going to talk about that a little bit more in a minute, 
taking prisoners and er enslaving and killing the, con uh, and the conquered leaders. So it had no preclassic walls around it. Number five, <clears throat> was there a preclassic ruin, Shilam, about one mile or so north from Kamen al -Huyu that had defensive walls around it? No. There is no evidence of preclassic ruin or city of Shilam located about two miles north of Kamen al -Huyu, containing evidence of defensive walls. And number six, was Kamen al -Huyu a safe place for Nephi to have taken his family to about 585 B.C.? A definite no. The heavy population of Kamen al -Huyu 585 B.C. of about 30,000 people, or perhaps more. There's a lot of numbers on that, but there's perhaps more. Precluded it from being the city of Nephi. I'd like to expand on the answer to this question uh, a little bit. What, in fact, did the city of Kamen al -Huyu look like when Nephi landed about the year 588 B.C.? How many people were living there? <clears throat> and... And how many people were living in the areas on the south coast as well? Okay, what was it like? This, was a, this is a photograph that shows what the beautiful city of Kamen al -Huyu probably looked like about the time Lehi landed in the Promised Land. Like I said, more than 30,000 people inhabited this area. It was started about 1500 B.C., but by about 750 B.C., the Lake Mita Floridas, which you can see right here, had been established... A huge farming operation was over here with, with dam and canal system. They were in the process of building all of these temples all the way around it. This was a huge six, square kilom six kilometer square complex. It was a huge complex. By about, it was constantly expanding its borders and sacrificing its conquered uh, leaders and using slaves to build their large adobe type structures, which is a little bit different than in other areas. By about 580 B.C., Kamen al -Huyu had become one of the largest pre-classic city-states in Central America, with only El Mirador and the Olmec Heartland larger in size. Now, can you imagine Nephi walking into Kamen al -Huyu with his four men, five or six women, 15 children under the age 12, 13, taking over Kamen al -Huyu, becoming king of Nephi, which he had become, and building a temple after the man, or Solomon's temple, and then controlling that whole area for 370 years? Impossible. This scenario could not have happened. He did not have the manpower or capacity to conquer the city-state of Kamen al -Huyu and become its king. It would have not have been a safe place for Nephi and his family to have settled. Now, what about the people, other people living in the area, various cultures along the Pacific Co Corridor? It is now without controversy, almost, that at the time Lehi landed, there were extensive civilizations or cultures existing in many areas in Mesoamerica, wherein hundreds of thousands and more likely millions of people resided. They also had a great deal of trading among the many Mayan communities and between the Mayan and Olmec and related cultures, especially along the Pacific Corridor. This pre-classic coastal, uh, Pacific coastal trade route went about as follows. From Kamen al -Huyu, from Kamen al -Huyu with its 30,000 people or so, down the coast to Monte Alto with its several thousand, then up the coast but inland a little ways to El Baul, and then on up the coast a bit to Takalikabak, and it had many thousands. And from there to Isapa, and they had many thousands, and Lehi landed somewhere in here. And then on up to Pihiapan and Antonala, and up into the Isthmus of Tehuantepec, going into trading with Oaxaca and San Lorenzo, La Venta, Tres Apotes, up to Veracruz, all of this area, the tremendous trading area. And this represented people at the time Lehi and Nephi landed in 580 BC. I submit that there were just too many people in Kamen al -Huyu, along the Pacific coast and in the Isthmus of Tehuantepec for Nephi to have safely located his small colony of 20 to 30 people in any of these locations. Since the answer to each of the above questions is in the affirmative, in the negative, 
then it should be concluded that Kaminahuyu could not have been the city of Nephi and the Grijalba River would not have been Sidon. Now, the answer to these same questions as to the Solomon Valley. What a difficult problem Nephi was faced with when he landed right about there where I've got it, when he landed. I submit that soon he realized of what was going on, the people, the populations, and so forth, and the Lord told him to go inland. I believe he quickly realized that he had to take his people to an area where he could <clears throat> protect them, to an area that was isolated from so many cultural and religious attractions. Had he gone to common old youth, they would have either killed the Nephites or made them assimilate, thus losing their culture and religion. As Guatemala City Temple President Clayton Mask told me a couple of weeks ago, that would have been like Brigham Young telling the saints to move on to San Francisco to build up the kingdom. I submit that Nephi, like Brigham Young, went inland to a safer location. I believe Nephi went inland to a beautiful, isolated, highly productive, and yet defensible valley snuggled just south of the narrow strip of mountainous wilderness, the Solomon Valley. It is located about midway between the Pacific Ocean and the Gulf of Honduras, precisely as described in the Book of Mormon. This photo shows the western part of that valley. It is a beautiful one with lots of rainfall, many small rivers feeding the Salama River, which flows into the Chishoy River and then becomes later the Sumacinta River. This photo shows the eastern part of the valley where the proposed Shemlon and I'll refer to again a little bit, the Shenland up there was located, and the ruin there is called El Porton, would have been located. There were more than 40 pre-classic ruins in this valley area. Salama Valley has a very agreeable Mediterranean type climate where all manner of fruits, vegetables, and grains can be produced. Gold, silver, and other minerals, including iron, are there in abundance. The finest and hardest jade in the world is found along the Chishoi fault line, including the Salomon area. Next is the photograph of the... of uh, Salomon looking about the middle, looking north. And right down here is the... Uh, uh, right down here is a ruin called Salkam, and this is where Dr. Hauk is doing a lot of digging in through here, which we believe is a city of Nephi. And right over here is Shemlon, I talked to you about that. And right up here is a, a ruin called San Juan, which we believe is Shalem, it's about a mile, mile and a half between here, and it's about two, not over three miles over here to Shemlon, to El Porton. Um, the Shemlon is a proposed city of the Shemlon, the Lamanite capital during Lim Limhi's reign, and it did not have defensive walls around it, which is very interesting and important. Both, both Nephi and, Sol, and Shilom here at San Juan had defensive walls around them. Now, just north of Shilom here, about two or three miles, is this hill right here. It's a pretty good size. It's about 1,000 feet in elevation, and we think this is the hill north of Shilom. And then from here, uh, right up in here, is an area where there are, we found evidences of a tower and three large reservoirs for holding water and evidence of a lot of pre-classic people living up there. From right there at that uh, hill north of Shilom, they follow the ridge on up through here, then up over through, and there's a, a little pass through here. And from there, they go right down to a valley called Taktik. And from there, they go about 10 or 15 miles over to Koban. And from there, for those familiar with it, from there you go down to Koban about 30, 40 miles to where the, the um, Iqbalay River meets the Usumasintha River. The evidence is abundant that tens of thousands of late pre-classic people occupied all of these areas. Dr. Richard Houck has identified over 30 geographical criteria taken from the Book of Mormon that directly correlate ancient Nephi with this Salama Basin. These seasons have been substantially verified, these reasons have been substantially verified by his archaeological excavations area. So far we are finding a great deal of evidence supporting this hypothesis. 
Let's quickly review the internal map. Um, the internal map to show the relationship that has to exist and then show a comparison between the Grijalva model and the uh, Iqbalé uh, uh, model, the Sumacinta Iqbalé model. The Sumacinta Iqbalé model is in white, showing the route from Zarahemla down up to Menon, then up to Mantai, and then down to Solomon in a straight south or south line. The green is the Grijalva model. And what we're going to do right just briefly, now we're going to follow this same route. I want you to look, notice how the Grijalva model goes, the route from Santa Rosa to Graminahuyu goes, instead of south, like this, it goes northeast to Comitan. And not only that, but it's elevation, elevation rise to 5,300 feet. And then it comes down to Mantai, which is located at La Libertad. And, and that's only 30 miles from right here, from Santa Rosa. Why did they go northeast up here to Comitan and then back down here, elevation 2150? Doesn't make sense. And then from there, they went down around or over the huge Comitan, the mountains over here to Huevitenango, elevation 7,100 feet. And from there, 80 miles down here to coming out you over very rough up and down territory. <clears throat> I'm gonna finish. The Grijalva route goes 33 miles longer than necessary because the Grijalva model misplaces Menon, thus requiring an indirect route contrary to what the Book of Mormon suggests. The distances, directions, and elevations of the Grijalva model just do not match what the Book of Mormon requires. I'm almost through. Although the Grijalva model makes an interesting and long-standing argument for the Grijalva River being the River Sidon, it is necessary to remember the specific direction stated in the Book of Mormon while determining the true Sidon. When we use the six critical questions suggested earlier to examine each model, the Grijalva model does not withstand the specific directions of the Book of Mormon. There is no hill north of Kaminahuyu. The narrow strip of wilderness cannot be seen from Kaminahuyu. In the Grijalva model, not a single city or river is located in the center of the land between the east and west seas. There were no late preclassic walls around Kaminahuyu. There was no late preclassic ruin north of Kaminahuyu with walls around it. And there were too many people living in the Kaminahuyu for Nephi to have conquered, converted, or assimilated into his, its culture. While Kaminahuyu does not meet any of these criteria, the Salama Valley meets all of them and many more. Therefore, this evidence from the Book of Mormon, when applied to the geography of Mesoamerica, convinces me that the Asumacinta was the River Sidon and the Grijalva was not. Thank you.